you're going to be integrating a lot of things like this, especially actually I do want, I, I know I just erased this problem. I'm going to, I'm going to write it back again because I want to point out. So like if you have to integrate something like this, x e to the 6x, which definitely is an integration by parts problem where you're going to let u equal x and dv equal e to the 6x. And the, one of the reasons we pick u equal to x is because it's the thing that gets simpler when we take the derivative. Whereas if we let u equal e to the 6x, its derivative wouldn't really be simpler, right? It would be the same. Um, so our du here is 1 times dx. What I want to point out is to find v, we have to anti-differentiate this, which is fine. She was doing it in class, and she was actually doing a u substitution, right? She was doing the integral of e to the 6x. I think she was using t since she already had used u somewhere else. She was letting t equal 6x, and then dt dx was equal to 6, so the dt over 6 was equal to dx. And then rewriting this as the integral of e to the t times dt over 6, or 1 sixth integral of e to the t dt, which is just 1 sixth e to the t, which is just 1 sixth e to the 6x. Okay. What I want to say about this is this is so much too much work for this one little part of this much larger question. What I really want to say is we don't have to do this. I mean, we, we do have to do this. We don't have to do all this. You don't have to do a write out the whole new substitution of this problem. What you can do, what I think you should do is get used to this process of what I like to call a mini U substitution, where you're not actually going to write out any work. You're going to say, hey, look, and I've already said this in class like probably 20 times, just not so, so explicitly. When we're integrating something and we know that the derivative would make you multiply by a constant, the antiderivative makes you divide by that constant. So we know that the antiderivative e to the 6x is 1 sixth e to the 6x. That's also what you get over here, but I'm fairly certain you don't have to show all this work. Now, you might want to double check with Dr. Burke. Maybe she really, really, really wants you to show this work when you do this antiderivative, but my guess is probably not. Um, so what I want to say about this is we're going to see that anything kind of like this, where it's just e to the something times x or sine of something times x or a, a basic function that we know how to anti-differentiate, but you have a multiple of x, we're going to say we can do that really easily. Um, I suppose I should finish this problem because I already started it. So this problem here, the integral of x times e to the 6x dx would be u times v minus the integral of v du. And then we would integrate this. So this is going to be, I think I can fit this in here. Still got this part. I would probably rewrite this part as x e to the 6x all over 6. Minus 1 6 times the integral of e to the 6x is again e to the 6x over 6. But I really, 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 really think for ones for u substitutions that are just such a small thing where you just say, oh, u is this multiple of x, you don't have to show that work. And so what I want to kind of do along with that is do a few more examples just to kind of get everybody really comfortable with the idea that, oh yeah, if I'm integrating e to the 6x, the answer is going to be e to the 6x divided by 6. Or if I'm integrating e to the negative one half x, the integral is going to be e to the negative one half x divided by negative one half, which we would then simplify and write as negative two times e to the negative one half x plus c. Or more generally, if you have e to the ax, the antiderivative is going to be one over a times e to the ax. 
Let's see. These come up often, right? I think she did at least twice in class just now. There were two times where she actually did a whole new substitution for this kind of problem. And I think that's just time we don't have really, that you probably don't have on a test to take the time to do the extra new substitution when you're already in the middle of an integration by parts problem. So I would encourage you to be comfortable with the same kind of idea here. We know the antiderivative of sine of x is negative cosine of x. The antiderivative of sine of 6x is negative cosine of 6x, well, that's a 6, divided by 6. Let's see. Or the antiderivative of sine of negative x over 2, which is negative 1 half times x, is negative sine of negative x over 2. But then we divide by the coefficient, which is negative 1 half. And then we would simplify this and write it as positive 2 times sine of negative x over 2. Let's see. Same deal here. The antiderivative of sine of something times x is going to be negative. Oops, or sine that I meant cosine. I'm sorry. That's a mistake. Sorry about that. The antiderivative of sine is negative cosine. And finally here, the antiderivative of sine of ax is negative cosine of a times x divided by a. Um, this comes up pretty frequently, so I want everyone to kind of, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this a lot. I will certainly point it out when I do it, but we're not gonna take the time and say, oh yeah, right? It's just, it's too onerous to take the time and say, okay, we're gonna let u equal negative one half x, my du dx is negative one half. So the negative two du equals dx. And then we write this as, this is what's on here. Then we write this as the integral of e to the negative one half x is u and dx is negative two du. And then integrate and get negative two e to the u and then negative two e to the negative one half. Right, it's just, it's a lot of process to, to do the same thing. So maybe in the beginning when you're doing these, you might actually write the whole substitution, but with practice, you really should try to get yourself to the place where you can just be like, oh yeah, I know I'm just dividing by that constant. Um, yeah, let's see. Oh, there was, yeah. There's one other type of function that I feel like this comes up often that we should practice it. So let's look at a few more real short examples. This one I'll do the long way as well. So what if I had to integrate, say, 1 over 6x plus 1? Well, I'm going to do the substitution. I'm going to let u equal the denominator. So u is going to equal 6x plus 1. We know that when we're letting u equal some constant multiple of x plus a constant, you're just going to get that du dx, the derivative is equal to that constant. So that it's really kind of easy to isolate dx. du equals 6 dx, 1 6 du equals dx. So I can rewrite this as the integral of 1 over u times 1 6 du. We like to bring the 1 6 out in front. And then the integral of 1 over u is the natural log of the absolute value of u. So this is 1 6 times the natural log of the absolute value of 6x plus 1. Let's see. But we're not surprised by this, right? We know that the integral of 1 over x is the natural log of the absolute value of x. So the integral of 1 over a multiple of x is going to be the natural log of the absolute value of that multiple of x divided by the coefficient of x. And in a similar way, I'm not going to show the work this time, the integral of say 1 over negative 3x plus 4, we know is going to be the natural log of the absolute value of negative 3x plus 4, but then we have to divide by the coefficient of x. So times a negative 1 third plus c. And that makes sense because if we took the derivative of this, it would be 1 over negative 3x. In fact, let's just write it out. 
the derivative of negative one third natural log of the opposite i of negative three x plus four is going to be negative one third times the derivative of the natural log of some stuff is one over the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. But the negative three and the negative one third cancel out and you get back to where you started. So that's the whole kind of idea here is that when you anti differentiate something and you've got something x multiplied by a constant, we almost always end up dividing by that constant in a mini u substitution. You can do the u substitution the long way, but I don't think you have to. Okay, I think I've said it enough times. So people ask for a few examples, which we'll definitely do before we get to um, talking about integration by parts. Yeah, we're still in, we still, we're still kind of in U sub mode. So let's look at, oh, where was that one someone asked me? Okay, this one looked kind of tricky. So let's look at this one. The integral from zero to one of e to the two x minus e to the negative two x over e to the two x plus e to the negative two x. Um, what do I want to say? Sometimes ones like this require tricks. This is not one of those times, but definitely problems like there are some problems like this where you have to like multiply the top and bottom by e to the two x. Um, yeah, which is not the case here, which is okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm just, yeah, yeah, that's fine, okay. So what we're gonna do here is we're actually going to just um, do new substitution. What's a good choice for you? Well, you can really kind of, you could, well, I mean, there's a lot of possible choices. I'm gonna try letting you equal the whole entire denominator. And the rationale for that choice, well, one is that it's stuck. But more importantly is I think the derivative of the denominator is going to equal the derivative is going to equal the numerator or close to it. So let's check it out. The derivative here, the derivative of e to the 2x is e to the 2x times 2. And then the derivative of e to the minus 2x is e to the minus 2x times the derivative of minus 2x, which is negative 2. I'm sorry, this plus is a little messy up here. But look, that's exactly the numerator times two. So we can say that du equals two times e to the two x minus e to the negative two x dx. And then we can divide both sides by two. So that one half du equals e to the two x minus e to the minus two x dx. And look, we've got that. There's your one half du. So let's rewrite this whole thing. This is going to equal one half integral. So I've dealt with the top. There's my one half du. I'm going to write a one in the top since I don't have anything else to put there. And then the denominator is just u. Now we should also change our limits of integration. So if x equals zero, u is going to be E, right, so here's u. So u is going to be e to the zero plus e to the zero, which is one plus one, which is two. And if x equals one, u is going to equal e squared plus e to the negative two, which isn't a nice number. It just is e squared plus e to the negative second. There's nothing else to be done with that. Right? If they were multiplied, you would get e to the zero, but they're not. They're added, which means people stop. E to the second plus E to the minus two. Oh well. Sometimes not everything is super nice. And then we have to differentiate this so we get the natural log of the absolute value of U. So it's going to be one half the natural log of the absolute value of U, evaluating from two to E squared plus E to the minus second. So I think I can squeeze in down here. We're going to get one half the natural log of the absolute value of E squared plus E to the minus two minus one half times the natural log of the absolute value of u. I would say in both of these, if you wanted to, you could drop the absolute values because this is positive and this is positive. 
I will also say there's no really other simplifying to be done here. You can't simplify this logarithm at all because the e squared is plus the e to the minus second. And this doesn't simplify either. So that's kind of your final answer. I guess you could factor out the negative one half if you really wanted to, or the one half if you wanted to, but that seems relatively inconsequential. Okay. Oh yeah, that was a tricky problem. Um, let's look at a couple other things. Where'd you go, examples that I had? Yeah. Couple problems involving some symmetry. So let's look at maybe an obvious one and then maybe a less obvious one. Let's look at, say, this one. The integral from negative pi to pi of x to the six times sine of x over four plus cosine of x. That will fully admit. Not only do I not know how to integrate this, I don't know if it can be integrated or at least answer differentiated, right? I don't, know, I don't think there's a function whose derivative is equal to that. That's okay. So when you see that the limits of integration are opposites of each other, that should be a clue that maybe, maybe this is an odd function. So the question we really should ask ourselves is, is this, Is this odd? Some teachers will let you just say it is. Some people want you to check. So to show a function's odd, here's what you have to show. You have to show that f of negative x is equal to negative f of x. That's how you show a function's odd. Um, and then there are a few things we get to, there are, there are the trig functions, we know they're odd or evenness. Cosine and secant are both even. The other four, sine, cosine, tangent, and sorry, sine, tangent, cosecant, and cotangent are all odd. Um, and we can think about the graphs of them, right? Cosine looks like this. Uh, let me see, try to draw it. Right? It definitely has the even symmetry where if you flip it around the x-axis, it looks the same, whereas sine has the odd symmetry. If you rotate it 180 degrees around the origin, it looks the same. So odd, even. So sine is odd, cosine is even, which means, so since sine is odd, it means that sine of negative x is equal to negative sine of x. That's what it means to be an odd function. And an even function, f of negative x is equal to f of x. So cosine is even, meaning we know that cosine of negative x equals cosine of x. The reason I point these things out is because we need to use them to show that this is odd or even, or neither. So I'm going to try and show this is odd, because if it's odd, what do I get to say? I get to say the integral is equal to what? That's a good question. Why do I even care about this being odd? Right, because if it's odd and the limits of integration are opposite signs of each other, then the integral is zero. Um, yeah, when we talk about improper integrals later on, there's kind of a special exception to this, but that's not something we need to worry about right now. Um, so we're going to look at f of negative x. That's going to be negative x to the sixth times sine of negative x over four plus cosine of negative x. Now I'm just going to do some simplifying. A negative x to the sixth power, well, an even power is going to do away with the negative sign, right? Negative, 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 negative is going to be positive. This is going to be positive x to the sixth. But sine of negative x, sine being an odd function, is equal to negative sine of x over 4 plus cosine of negative x. Well, cosine being an even function is equal to cosine of x. 
So look, this is equal to the same function I started with, except there's an extra minus factor here. So this is indeed equal to minus one times x to the six times sine of x over four plus cosine of x, which shows that this is equal to negative f of x. So this function is odd, which means this is equal to zero. So the thing I would say is that if you see something that looks crazy, you're like, I have no clue how you might integrate that. And you also notice the limits of integration are opposite signs of each other. That's often a good clue that you probably are in this situation. Um, let me show you one, one or two more. Yeah, I got two more. So let's look at this one. The integral, where'd you go? Of, oh, sorry, I'm bringing it. Uh, negative four, four of two x over one plus x squared. One way you could do this is totally say, oh yeah, this equals zero because the function two x over one plus x squared is odd. We can check this really easily. F of negative x is two times negative x over one plus negative x squared, which is negative two x over one plus x squared, which is definitely negative f of x. But here, it's probably not so obvious that we have to do this. In fact, we don't have to do this. You could totally attempt to do this problem in a more normal way, right? I mean, right, something that's just not super it's not always something we're looking for, right? Like you might just kind of forget, oh, that function's odd, I didn't see it, oh well. So this problem can certainly be done another way. We could try a u sub. We could let u equal one plus x squared. And then my du dx is two x. So du is two x dx. And so if we start rewriting this, there's my du. So I've got the integral of du over u. Now here's the thing. This is actually a really good, um, this is a real, this is a sales pitch for why you should always change your limits of integration. If you don't change the limits of integration, right? If you just like, oh, negative four to four, and we're gonna change it all back later, right? Then you do the integral, you get natural log of u, you plug, you plug in, you get, so you get like, if you did all the work, you get natural log of u, which is then natural log of the absolute value of one plus x squared from negative four to four. And you've done more work than you had to because check this out. If we change them to integration, so if x is four, u is gonna be what? 17. If x is negative four, u is gonna be what? 17. Right. And when the limits of integration are the same, you get zero. So this is another good reason why or why it's really useful or helpful to change limits of integration because they can cut out the work. Sometimes you have a situation like this where you get zero worth of interval. Um, yeah. Okay. One more. And I think that's, that's all the stuff I had to say about that. And then we should probably talk about integration by parts. Well, I think, I think the professor, as usual, did a very good job talking about it. Let's look at this last definite interval. Square root of three to three of x times five minus x squared. Um, and you might be wondering why I'm thinking of this in the same context, because it, currently it doesn't really look like we can do anything short of just, well, can we do a use of here? I think so, yeah. We can let you equal this stuff. That's gonna be all right. Um, you could also multiply it out, I guess, right? You, this isn't, 
this isn't beyond the realm of reason to multiply out. You shouldn't, right? If you've got a use of option, you should definitely take it. So we're gonna let u equal the stuff inside the cubic. And then our du dx is gonna be negative two x. And then our du, our negative one half du, right? Divide both sides by negative two is gonna equal x dx. And I've got an x dx. There's my d, there's my negative one half du. All right, so we've got negative one half integral of there's my du, and then here's my u cubed. And my new limits of integration are gonna be so if x is the square root of three, right? and so depending on how you, sh you should write out as much as you feel like you need to. Right? If you can just mentally do it, that's fine. But to know what, oh, I need to really write it down. So u is five minus x squared. If x is the square root of three, u is gonna be five minus three, which is two. And then if x is three, and did I screw this up? I totally screwed this up. I didn't totally screw it up, but I slightly screwed up. Um, I wanted this three to actually be not three. Sorry about that. I wanted this three to actually be the square root of seven. Sorry. Square root of seven? Am I just crazy now? No, that's right, yeah. So, yeah, sorry about that. Luckily, it hadn't really made a huge difference yet. If x is the square root of seven, u is gonna be five minus seven, which is negative two. So what happens after the substitution here is that you actually end up with an odd function whose limits of integration are opposite signs of each other. And you could certainly flip this around if you really felt the need to, or you could write this as positive one half integral from negative two to two of u cubed. This is not a necessary step. You could totally at this juncture just say, hey, that's zero. Or you can do this and then say it's zero. It's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting to think that if you multiply this whole thing out and integrate it and then plug this in, you would get zero. Okay. Um, let me see what I said. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and kind of switch over to the integration by parts gear. And let me grab my, oh, come on, compute door. Sometimes my computer does this thing. It's not that terrible, but like all the stuff that's at the bottom of the screen wants to move over to the other screen I have here. And I don't like that. One over here, okay, good, let me get back. But it's just like, it takes a minute. Um, where'd you go? That's not the right thing. Oh my goodness. Sorry, I'm hiding stuff from myself. There it is. Okay. Integration by parts. Um, yeah, what do I want to say? I mean, I want to say a lot of things. So where to start? I guess the first thing I want to say is. You kind of memorize the formula, formula of five terms, in that you're typically we're thinking of the integral of u times dv is equal to u times v minus the integral of v times d. And so the thought here always is that we are picking, right? So this is what we're starting with. We're starting with this. And we're picking u and dv. So we have to pick this and pick this. And we want to make choices so that v times du is nicer to integrate. Right? That's why she was saying in class, you want to pick a u whose derivative is simpler because the derivative is what we're going to be integrating later on. And V hopefully won't get too much more complicated when we anti-differentiate DV. Usually it's not a big deal. Or I mean, eh, eh, eh. so this is the whole idea. There's a 
mnemonic device for lack of a better thing. Um, some people like to remember this as ultra violet super voodoo where the ultraviolet is the U, the, uh, the ultra is the U, the violet's the V, the super is the integral sign, the voodoo is the V DU. So it's something that certainly stuck with me over the years. Ultraviolet super voodoo is UV minus the integral of VDU. Or whatever way you want to remember, as long as you can remember that the integral of u dv is equal to uv minus the integral of dv. Um, and so the idea is that when you, I guess the question is really best is how do we know when we want to use integration by parts? And the answer is it's complicated. The bigger picture answer is we typically want to use integration by parts when we have what I call a mixture of types of functions. A mixture being, so here are the typical types. So the types of functions are logarithmic, logarithmic, um, inverse trig, although that doesn't show up much. Algebraic, and when we say algebraic, it's a very kind of, someone was trying to make an acronym work when they picked algebraic. What we really mean is just X to a power. So X to a power, like X squared, X to the one third, X to the negative fifth, right? Which can look very different, right? This can look like the cube root of X. This can look like one over X to the fifth. The last couple of things are trig. So anything sine, cosine, secant, tangent, cosecant, cotangent. And then the very last thing is exponential, like e to the x, sine, cosine, et cetera, e to the whatever. So when you have a mixture, meaning at least two of these things, that is typically a time to use either, hopefully use substitution, because usually use substitution is easier. But if you try use sub and it doesn't work or you can just see it's not gonna work, then usually integration by parts. So when we have a mixture of things, we often try use sub and or integration by parts. Let's look at some examples. Let's look at the following examples. Now let's start with the integral of x times e to the x squared dx. Okay. So this example, we so I would encourage everyone to always default to integration by part. So whoa, whoa, oh my God, words, no such lies coming out of my mouth. I would encourage everyone to default to u substitution before you try something else. U substitution, really, after you learn all the methods of integration that you're gonna learn, U sub is like the nicest. You're like, yeah, I got a U sub, great, that's super straightforward. The other stuff can be more kind of weird, but U sub is great, we're always kind of happy to have just a U sub. And here U sub works, right? We can let U equal X squared, DU is gonna be, oh, I should say, sorry, DU DX is gonna be two X, so one half du is going to be x dx. So this ends up equaling, so my x dx, that's my one half du. And e to the x squared is going to be e to the u. So this integrates nicely. It's just one half e to the u plus c, which is just one half e to the x squared. I should also point out 
This one, even if we wanted to do any of our parts, we really wouldn't be able to. Because, well, I mean, I guess we could, would be stupid. Um, but what I'm really trying to say is, if you were to pick dv equal to e to the x squared, I want to remind everybody, e to the x squared on its own cannot be anti-differentiated. There is no function that is the antiderivative of e to the x squared. It's just the way it is. Same is true for like sine of x squared. There's a lot of weird combinations of something of x squared or, some, or something of x cubed that just don't anti-differentiate. Um, on the other hand, this seemingly simpler looking function, x e to the two x, we cannot do with a u substitution, right? We can't let, I mean, we can let u equal two x, but then your du is just gonna be, or your, your, yeah, your du is just gonna be two dx. We, we're missing the x there. So this one, this mixture, we really have to do in ratio of parts. So we're gonna pick, and, and so I think she kind of said this in class, but didn't say it like very strongly. The way we pick U is with this acronym that almost always works. Where this is the order of types of functions we choose for you. First, we look to see, is there a logarithm? No. Is there an inverse trig? No. Is there an algebraic term, meaning x to a power? Yes, there's x to the first. So that is our choice for you. And then the rest has to be dv. So if u is x, then dv has to be everything else, which is e to the 2x, dx. Um, I didn't notice when she was doing it if she was including the dx or not. It's pretty standard to include it, but if she didn't, that's not like a huge crime. So u is x, dv is e to the 2x dx. The derivative of u, du dx would equal one. So du is gonna equal one times dx. And dv, the antiderivative, so right, this is one of those times where I don't wanna actually do a u substitution to do the antiderivative here. I just wanna say the antiderivative e to the 2x is one half e to the 2x. And so then we're gonna write this as, you don't have to write this out every time. I like writing it out. <clears throat> we're not, so I should also point out, we're not like changing variables, right? We're not changing this to be in terms of U's and V's. We're using U and V to kind of say what X, what U and V are equal to in terms of X. But this when we plug things in, you still just get all the X things, right? I'm gonna plug in, x for u and one half e to the two x for v minus, um, let's see, v, where it goes one half, so the integral of one half e to the two x du is dx. And look, now this thing is much easier to anti-differentiate. So here we're gonna get, x times one half e to the two x minus the one half constant can hang out in front and the antiderivative e to the two x is one half e to the two x or e to the two x divided by two plus c. Um, let's see, sure. Oh, yeah, it's fine. Um, there was something here that I had that seemed important. Sorry, my notes are all over the place today. Oh, someone asked about that question. Yeah. Um, I should point out, somebody asked me to do the following integral, which I didn't do. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna take a shortcut here. I don't remember who it was, but someone asked for this, the integral from one to the square root of two of x e to the x squared. And so we've done the integral. Now you just have to, instead of doing plus C, plug in the square root of two first and the one side. So I guess, I guess we could write it out, right? If you're doing the definite integral here, sorry, I've like run out of room. 
um, it would end up equaling one half e to the square root of two squared. So that'd be one half e to the second minus one half e to the first squared. So one half e. So for whoever asked me that question, where was this integral from one to the square root of two? It's just that with the values built in. Sorry, I totally forgot about that one. Um, what time is it? Okay. I feel like I should give you guys a definite integral with this. So when it comes to definite integrals and integration by parts, things can be messy for sure. Um, like, mm, let me think for a second here. Sure, I don't want to make it super gross. Oh yeah, let's do that. Let's do the integral from one to six of x cubed natural log of x. And the x, uh, let's, let's get a little less crazy there, James. Let's do the integral from one to three. That seems less terrible. Um, so here's my personal perspective. I don't like carrying these limits of integrations with me throughout the whole process. It's definitely fine, like she did in class, and that's totally cool. So, I mean, cool, right? Math cool, okay. So, but let's do the let's do the, the problem before we get too carried away. So, for this one, again, looking at our Lie acronym for how we choose u, we're going to choose u equal to the natural log of x, and then dv is the rest. Right? Once you pick u. DV is everything else that's multiplied by it. So essentially you take your whole integral, divide out what you chose for you and the rest is DV. And the thing about DV is it should be easy to integrate. Typically the way people often say about DV is DV is the most complicated thing that's still easy to integrate. And that's definitely X cubed, right? Natural log of X, is not easy to integrate. It can be done as she did in class, right? But you have to use integration of parts to do it. So typically you shouldn't be choosing for dv something that has to be done with integration by parts. So that means we should be picking u equal to natural log of x. Our du, our derivative of natural log of x is one over x. So du dx is one over x, so du is one over x dx. And then our antiderivative here is x to the fourth, sorry, is it v equal to x to the fourth, apologies. Um, yeah, so a couple different schools of thought. One school of thought is to write this as uv, uh, sorry, x to the fourth over four. Sorry. So uv, so natural log of x times x to the fourth over four, evaluated from one to three, minus the integral from one to three, uh, then x to the fourth over four times one over x dx. And then you can start evaluating. I'm going to plug in a three. You get natural log of three. I just, to me, it feels like there's kind of a lot moving here at once. Times three to the fourth over four minus natural log of one times one over four. By the way, natural log of one is zero. Minus, pull out the one fourth, the integral of x to the fourth over x is x cubed. This is an important thing to be aware of. I see people make this mistake way too many times to not say anything about it. When you get to here, you have to simplify this. I've definitely seen people try to integrate this as x to the fifth over 20 times the natural log of x, because they're trying to integrate each part separately and multiply the results together. We can't do that. It never works. What we have to do always is simplify the insides. Um, so yeah, and it's always gonna work nicely with, with a power of x and a natural log. Because when you take the derivative of natural log, you just get x to the minus first, and that's always gonna cohesively go with some other power of x. So let's see, I've got natural log of three times three to the fourth is 81 over four minus one fourth the antiderivative of x cubed is x to the fourth over four from one to three. So I end up with, I feel like a gross answer. 
Now it's probably three times 81 over four minus, I'm gonna plug in three. I'm gonna get three to the fourth, which is 81 over 16 minus, I'm gonna plug in one and get one over 16. This part actually ends up equaling five because it's 80 over 16, which is five. Um, so what I want to point out is alternatively, what I like to do, and I think it kind of works, I wish I had more room on the board. Um, actually, this is 81 over four times natural log of three minus five. But what I kind of want to point out, I guess I'll do it on the other side of the board is what I often prefer to do, and this is totally a personal choice, I think, is I just like to do the indefinite integral first. Yeah, x cubed times natural log of x. And so then you do the same, you set the same integration of Hertz. U is natural log of x. DU is one over x dx. DV is x cubed dx. The V is x to the fourth over four. And then you rewrite this as UV minus the integral of V du. V times du, I'm gonna simplify a lot x to the fourth over four, x dx, which is going to be natural log of x times x to the fourth over four minus one fourth integral of x cubed. And then finally we get natural log of x times x to the fourth over four minus one fourth times x to the fourth over four. And then what I like to do, so after I've done the indefinite integral, then I can go back and say, okay, now I want to find the definite integral from one to three of the natural log of x times x cubed dx. Well, I already know the antiderivative is this. So it's just going to be the natural log of x times x to the fourth over four minus x to the fourth over 16 from one to three. And to me, this just feels a little bit less janky. Like the other way just feels like you've got kind of stuff all over the place. We're here kind of first doing the antiderivative and then after we found the antiderivative, we're plugging in the limits of integration. As usual, you should do what works best for you. So if you think this is better for you, do this. If you think it makes more sense to plug in the limits of integration right away when here and then keep integrating here, do that. But I personally, happen to find that it's just easier for me to not lose track of anything if I do the antiderivative and then I plug in my limits of integration. So then we would plug it in, we get natural log of three times 81 over four minus 81 over 16 minus, then we plug in one, natural log of one is zero minus one over 16. So we end up getting the natural log of three times 81 over four. Minus 81 over 16 plus one over 16 is minus 80 over 16 or minus five, which should be the same answer I got over here. It is, yeah. Um, yeah, it's a lot of stuff. Um, so it's three o'clock, I should stop talking, but, but. Um, there was one other question somebody asked me that I just wanted to address real quick. So it's the one, it, I, and I feel like everyone might want to see this. So let me at least throw it up here. And then if you want to leave, you can go. But I just want to point out, um, somebody asked this question. It's the integral from, where'd you go? Yeah, from one to two of the square root of four minus x squared using geometry, um, which definitely was a homework problem, I think. So the idea here is, right, You've got the top half of a circle of radius two. So if, you, if you've seen this one or don't want to see this one, you're welcome to go. Um, but here's kind of the gist. Right, so it's a quarter of a circle, except it's not, right? It's this part of the circle. How do we calculate that? Well, we use geometry, which I know is what the instruction said. Like, I know I'm not saying anything exciting. But here's what we're really doing. We're going to say, well, it's, It's this area, 
the area of a sector. The area of a sector is one half the angle times the radius squared minus the area of that triangle. So we have to figure out two things. We have to figure out how tall this triangle is. We have to figure out what that angle is. Both of them are not as bad as they might look. Um, it's just what we know. We know the base here is one. We know the height here is not two. We know the radius here is two. And then we can find the height using the Pythagorean theorem. One squared plus the height squared equals two squared. So the height is equal to the square root of four minus one. So the area of this triangle is one half the base times the height which is the square root of three over two. Okay, this angle, well, if we know the base is one and the height is the square root of three and this side is two, you could either say that's a pretty well-known triangle. It's actually the well-known triangle where the angles are 30, 60, 90, or you could use a trig function. Say, well, this angle is theta and I see that cosine of theta should equal the adjacent over the hypotenuse, which is one half. And I know an angle that, where that's true, it's 60 degrees or pi over three radians. So the area of this sector is one half times the angle pi over three times the radius squared. Cancel a two there and a two there. So you get two pi over three. So the area of this weird little section here is two pi over three, the area of the total sector, minus root three over two, the area of the triangle. Kind of weird.